Uh, good morning. Thank you, Reen, and thank you, Jen, for inviting me and sharing uh, the podium with a great group of speakers, all good friends. Uh, during uh, 15 minutes, we will cover uh, the following topics, the role of CT in the evaluation of bowel obstruction, a couple words on technique, focus mostly on the important complications, namely closed-loop obstruction and ischemia, and then uh, not too much on the specific causes of obstruction. This is a very important and common cause of admission to our EDs. 15% of those presenting with acute abdominal pain have suspected or confirmed bowel obstruction. The majority respond to conservative therapy, and that's important as we understand what the role of imaging and CT really is. Mortality varies between 2 and 8%. 25% with the presence of ischemia and delayed surgery. So that already tells you how important detecting ischemia is. 70% of all cases of bowel obstruction are caused by adhesions. Again, very relevant as this determines how and when to use CT. The two most common ones are hernias, malignancies, and then others as shown on the slide. So what is the purpose of CT and imaging? We want to, number one, determine whether or not there is obstruction Second, if there is obstruction, what is the probable site, the severity, potentially the cause? More importantly than any of those is to uh, ascertain if there is any sign of ischemia or suggestion of a closed loop as the complication of bowel obstruction. And for these, CT is by far the best method. This is our protocol. It's very simple. We still acquire thin reconstruct thick, send everything to the packs, of course give IV contrast with very few exceptions, single phase is all that is necessary. We do not give oral contrast, Dr. Anderson is going to uh, get a little bit deeper into why that is the case. And we always say that multiplanar reformats are important, but this is particularly true in the case of bowel obstruction. Not only do we acquire the images, but we use them routinely for the diagnosis, diagnosis and evaluation. For example, this case, yes, there's dilatation of small bowel. There are some collapsed loops, so already we're thinking there is bowel obstruction. We scroll up and down. We don't see the transition point. The same with the coronals. We now see the small, uh, small bowel feces signs. So yes, there's obstruction, but instead of spending a lot of time in the coronals and the axials, very quickly, in the sagittal view, we see exactly where the obstruction is. That's the transition point, small bowel feces sign. So we use the three uh, planes routinely and interchangeably to determine what is important in uh, bowel obstruction. What are the signs? I already showed you the examples. Bowel dilatation, number one. There is or should be a transition point that you may or may not see. Proximal dilatation, distal collapse, already a good a combination of findings to indicate that there is a transition point at, uh, somewhere in uh, the abdominal cavity, and then uh, the small bowel feces sign. We classify bowel obstruction into two different types. A simple type when there's a single point of obstruction, and we try to determine whether it's high grade or low grade, although clinical features and signs are more useful in that separation. Closed loop obstruction, as I will show you, have two sides of obstruction that affect, affect the same loop by definition, and strangulation occurs when there is ischemia leading to wall necrosis. Very simple slide to illustrate what a simple obstruction is all about. There is a point of transition here, typically an adhesion, could be any other cause of obstruction, proximal dilatation, distal collapse, and you expect to see the feces sign just proximal to the point of transition. Translate that to CT images, actual and coronal planes, very simple. Again, point of transition here, proximal dilatation with fluid, distal collapse shown very nicely on both the actual and coronal planes. As I've been showing you and telling you, the small bowel feces sign can be seen, but it's not as helpful as the transition point. It represents solid appearing intestinal contents, which typically is found just proximal to the point of transition. And it helps because of that localizing that potential transition point. Good example here, we see that there is a small bowel feces sign, and if you look carefully, exactly distal to the, to the more formed uh, content of, uh, in, in the small bowel, that's where the transition point is located. One more example with the same, 
right here, proximal dilatation, distal collapse, and the point of transition just distal to where most of the small bowel feces sign is found. This is perhaps the most important message of this talk is the identification of closed loop obstruction and its uh, complications. So coming back to the same uh, diagram that I showed earlier, this one illustrates what a closed loop obstruction represents. Notice that there is a site through which a loop of small bowel has migrated and that creates two points of transition, the proximal and the more distal end, and just proximal to that site of where the closed loop is being formed, the bowel should be dilated, as shown here, and the distal loop, the distal bowel coming out of the closed loop should be collapsed. Sounds simple, looks simple. On the uh, diagram, we all know how difficult it is to determine if a patient truly has a closed loop obstruction. And that's because the signs on CT are not easily determined by what the diagram is shown. So what are those signs? We see C or U-shaped loops of bowel in any plane, radial distribution of those dilated loops that are being formed or create the closed loop, and we should and uh, almost always see two points of transition with the so-called beak sign. And perhaps the best way to understand what a closed loop is, is a, a situation or a case of an incarcerated hernia as in this one. Notice that yes, there is a closed loop, it, it's a very short segment of bowel that is trapped in the hernia itself and the two points of transition are created at the neck of the hernia. We have an entering site right here with one transition point and the proximal bowel is dilated whereas the exit loop of bowel shown here, the exit transition point, leads to collapsed loop of bowel. So that's what we see in an internal hernia that is incarcerated, and this concept applies to every single closed loop, no matter where is it located and no matter what the cause may be. Another case here of a closed loop in, uh, inside the peritoneal cavity, so we look, need to look for those more indirect signs. There is a cluster of dilated loops of small bowel that are focally dilated. Clearly you see a U shape in the left hemiabdomen and the mesentery in between though that loop is edematous. So the cluster, the configuration already makes us think there is a closed loop. Let's look for that transition point. Another example on a different patient, a cluster of dilated loops of small bowel, distal collapse, so there's clearly obstruction, but this configuration of radially distributed loops of bowel with the epicenter being the site where the closed loop is being formed, the mesentery is abnormal, there is already free fluid, these are the signs of closed loop that we should be on the lookout for. Now, if we uh, look carefully and use all the planes, we should, and I say should because it's not possible in every single case, see the two points of transition usually very close to each other as shown in this case. There is proximal dilatation, there's a cluster of dilated loops of small bowel, and we see the two points of transition which indicates the site under which or through which the closed loop is being created, almost always an adhesive band or a rent in the mesentery if there is history of prior surgery. Beyond closed loop, we also need to look for signs of ischemia. I already mentioned how important it is in terms of determining the prognosis of the patient. Ischemia is caused by either increased intraluminal pressure from progressive bowel distension or by direct occlusion of the arteries and veins caused by volvulus or by increased pressure within the closed loop. If untreated, a, clo a closed loop eventually leads to ischemia and ischemia eventually leads to necrosis. So essentially every closed loop needs to be treated uh, surgically. What are the signs of ischemia or strangulation? Bowel wall thickening with target sign, mesentery congestion and edema, ascites. The most important one is abnormal enhancement of bowel wall. And if it has progressed to necrosis, you may see pneumatosis or portal venous gas. How good is CT for determining ischemia? It's actually very good, as shown in this uh, study in the surgical literature. In fact, CT, the two more important signs of uh, bowel wall thickening, suspected closed loop, are positively correlated with uh, 
proven ischemia at surgery, whereas all these clinical and lab uh, results such as leukocytosis, acidosis, everything we've heard about are not good predictors of ischemia on surgery. So CT is really the best tool that our surgeons have to identify ischemia, which means that we as radiologists really are the best friend that can help them determine who needs to go to the OR. Uh, a few examples of what should be looking for. Yes, there is obstruction in this patient, but there are many signs of ischemia. The, the wall is thickened in that right lower quadrant. There is poor enhancement, and there is ascites. Ascites is a very uh, ominous sign in the presence of bowel obstruction. If already you are seeing signs of ischemia, very likely the patient will need a uh, resection of, of bowel. Changes in enhancement. Notice here we transition from slightly hyper-enhancement to absent enhancement in the uh, wall of this loop of small bowel. There is, in addition, edema in the mesentery, portal venous gas, all the signs we look for uh, in ischemia and necrosis. Another similar patient, there is thickened, uh, multiple thickened loops of bowel in the lower abdomen, dilated mesenteric edema, ascites, and in addition, the two transition points next to each other, so this is a closed loop already with signs of, of ischemia and very likely necrosis. This is a surgical emergency, regardless of what the surgeon says about the patient. And you will hear, oh, there's no acidosis, there's no leukocytosis, the patient actually looks very well. Well, the CT does not look very well. That patient needs to go to the operating room. We can sometimes identify the exact cause of the closed loop, as in this case. Yes, we see signs of a closed loop obstruction where there's a cluster, a loop of small bowel, which are now necrotic because they are not enhancing well. But the location of these loops of bowel and that encapsulated appearance tells us that this is an internal hernia leading to the closed loop and the subsequent ischemia and infarction, proven parododinal hernia. Uh, in this particular patient. We've already heard, we'll continue to hear, and I will show you just one example of how dual energy can be used. We routinely acquire or uh, generate several multi-energy series, send all of them to the packs, use them in our diagnostic uh, uh, potential, and I don't think there's any question that this patient has not only ischemia but necrosis of a long segment of bowel, but it's more evident as we've seen this morning with the 40K V image and even more so with this iodine map. How get a CT for uh, detecting and classifying obstruction? Very good. Sensitivity about 95%, a little bit lower specificity. For detecting that transition point up to 90%, I already mentioned for ischemia up to 100%, but closer to 80% when you combine all series. And for determining the need of, for surgery, which is really the most important uh, parameter, 94%, 95% sensitivity and lower specificity. But CT is better than any combination of clinical, clinical or laboratory parameter, parameters to make this determination. One word on the role of KUB. It's not that we have forgotten about the KUB. In fact, it still has its use, mostly for triaging patients and deciding what to do next as shown in this relatively recent published paper. This is a review paper by Eric Paulson and Bill Thompson, uh, who are both, we call them experts in the field of uh, bowel obstruction. I think it, it does well in uh, determining when to use CT and when to use KUBs. Notice that they start with a KUB to determine what to do next. If the, patient, if the KUB is negative and there's low clinical suspicion, nothing else to be done, every other patient essentially goes to CT, as would have happened or happened to this patient in whom, yes, we see signs of obstruction, but we need to look for complications, potential cause, is there a closed loop, et cetera, et cetera, as I've been saying. This patient should go to CT unless there's a clinical reason to take him or her directly to the operating room. That's the one exception in that algorithm where no CT is performed after an abnormal KUB. So in summary, CT is a critically important uh, tool in determining the management of patients with SBO. It is the best tool surgeons have, so it's up to us to really tell them who needs to go to the OR. Uh, in terms of technique, as you will hear again later, no oral contrast, NPRs are absolutely necessary and use them. We need to detect the complications, closed loop, 
and ischemia, they go together, but they don't always occur in combination. We may sometimes find a specific cause. I show you one case of an internal hernia. Most of them are adhesions. We do not see the adhesive band directly, but we can see intersusceptions, gallstonilias, and other causes specifically. And finally, in terms of radiography, we use it for triaging. Thank you very much.